Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar entitled Head-to-Head -head Comparisons Using Real-World Data, The Time for Causal Inference is Now. So this will be the first in a series of webinars focusing on target trial emulation and causal inference approaches using real-world data. So I'm very pleased to introduce our two presenters for this first webinar, Dr. Miguel Hernan and Devin Boyne. So our first speaker will be Dr. Miguel Hernan. Miguel Hernan has an MD and PhD and is the Colocatronis Professor of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Hernan holds many senior advisory positions, including as a special government employee for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, as a data science advisor for ProPublica, and as an editor for the journal Epidemiology. We are extremely excited to be working with Miguel on multiple target trial emulations, as he has been the eminent thought leader in causal inference using real-world data. His textbook on causal inference entitled, What If, has elegantly distilled the frameworks for causal thinking into usable techniques and approaches in epidemiology, and we're very pleased to have him as part of this webinar series. Our second speaker will be Mr. Devin Boyne. Devin is a director of epidemiology at Cytel. He is a PhD candidate in epidemiology in the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary and holds a master's degree in epidemiology from Queen's University. Within the team at Cytel, Devin has quickly become a leader in the application of causal inference methods in real-world data. Devin's research interests include the emulation of target trials using real-world data, the development and assessment of clinical prediction models, and methods for conducting indirect treatment comparisons and network meta-analyses. So without further ado, I would pass it along to Dr. Fernand to start the webinar. Thank you, Darren. Very happy to be here. I'm going to be talking about how to use real-world data to emulate a target trial. So the first thing when we talk about causal inference is to, is to realize that causal inference is what, what we do to learn what works and what harms. And this is something that we can do in clinical research when, when people want to know whether to treat with a treatment A or with a treatment B, to treat now or to treat later, to treat everybody or treat some people only. Uh, this, these are all questions that, that, that people are asking every day. There are decisions that have to be made. And the way in which we inform this decision is by doing causal inference. We compare uh, the, the, the outcomes under different courses of action, and we compare the, the effectiveness and safety under different courses of action. That is what causal inference is. Some people call it comparative effectiveness and safety. Some people call it different names. That is causal inference. It's what we do to learn what works and what harms. So if you ask any scientist, how do we learn what works? The, the answer is, is pretty standard. Is well, we conduct a randomized trial. And a randomized trial, a randomized experiment in humans is the way in which we try to learn what works or what harms. If you think about any, any question that you may have about comparative effectiveness or comparative safety, for any question, there is a randomized trial that would answer that question if we could conduct that trial. Of course, what happens in practice is that there are many randomized trials that we cannot conduct because they are too expensive, because they are not ethical, because they are not practical, or simply because they are not timely, meaning that we, we may be able to conduct that, those randomized trials, but not instantly. There will be a lag between the time when a decision has to be made for the first time and the, and the time when, when the findings from our randomized trial are ready. And that lag may be two, five, 10 years. It depends on the type of question. In, in all of these cases, what we do when we don't have a randomized trial or we don't have a randomized trial yet is to use observational data. And we analyze observational data because we don't have data from a randomized trial yet. And that is a point that I would like to emphasize. It's not that we love using observational data or real world data. It's that it's the only thing that we can do. If we want to support decision making, either we use observational data or we use our gut feeling. 
that in the absence of randomized trial data, there are no alternatives if we want to base our decisions on human data. But this also means that, see, for, for each causal inference question that we have about effectiveness or safety, we can imagine the hypothetical randomized trial that we would prefer to our observational data. So there is for any question that we that we want to answer, we can think of what would be the randomized trial that we would like to conduct if that were possible. And that randomized trial that may be purely hypothetical, that's the target of our inference, really. We refer to that trial as the target trial. The target trial is the hypothetical randomized trial that we that we'd like to conduct to answer our causal question. This has a this has an implication. Thinking in terms of a target trial has the implication that that any observational analysis that we conduct for causal inference can be can be viewed as an attempt to emulate the target trial. There is this question that we have. We know which which target trial would an answer that question. We are using observational data. So our goal with the use of the observational data is to emulate the target trial as closely as possible. In fact, we can, we can go further. If we cannot explain what our target trial is when we are analyzing observational data, then chances are our causal question is not very well defined. Now, this idea of the target trial is an idea that has a, a long history in causal inference. Uh, the first, the first um, reference to it uh, is by Dorn in the 50s, or the first one that we have found. Uh, Bill Cochran in the 60s, and Don Rubin, and Feinstein, and David in the 70s were, were, were talking about this idea of the target trial. They were not using that label. Uh, but they were using about the same concept that we, when we analyze observational data for causal inference, we have to think of what the hypothetical randomized trial that we're trying to approximate is. And then in the 80s, uh, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Robbins at Harvard expanded this, this concept of the target trial to more complex settings in which we have time varying treatments and time varying confounders, uh, multiple eligibility points and outcomes measures at, at many points, a, a, a complex longitudinal data, which is exactly the type of data that we have when we are working with real world data with uh, electronic health records or, or with claims, etc. So if we think in terms of a target trial, we can think about causal inference in two very simple steps. The first step for causal inference is to ask a causal question, and the second step is to answer the causal question. And these two steps are very important, both. A lot of times, when we talk about causal inference, when we teach causal inference or causal inference methods, everything is, is focused on number two, on how to use the methods. But how to use the methods have no, uh, has not a lot of interest if we don't know what we're using the methods for. So when we're asking the causal question, it's like we're pointing at the target. And then when we answer the causal question, is we're shooting at the target. We don't know what the causal question is. We don't know where we're shooting. Now, how, how do we know how to ask a causal question? Well, there's that, a simple device. Just uh, tell me what is the protocol of your target trial. If we can specify the protocol of the target trial, then we know exactly what our causal question is, which means what I'm saying is that every time that we are using observational data to, um, to try to answer a causal question, the first step is to design a randomized trial. A randomized trial that we are not going to conduct, but we need to design the randomized trial first so we know what we are trying to do. And then we analyze the observational data. In fact, if we want to answer the causal question, there are two options. Option A is we conduct the target trial that we have just designed, or we cannot do that. We use the observational data to explicitly emulate the target trial. And explicitly is the key word here. And then after that, we can worry about fancy causal inference methods, but those come last. And often they are not even the most important part. Now, when I say um, we have to specify the protocol of a target trial, I mean that we need to define the key components of the protocol of a randomized trial. 
that we are trying to emulate, which are listed there. And then we have to use the observational data to emulate each of the components explicitly. OK, so why, why is this important? Well, this is important because it turns out that a lot of problems with the analysis of observational data, of real-world data, a lot of the big problems that we see in, in, in both the scientific journals and the lay press are typically because they are not explicitly, those analyses are not explicitly emulating a target child. And let me give you a couple of examples. The first example is a classic now is the example of hormone therapy and heart disease. OK. As I'm sure many of you know, and you have listened to me before, I really like this example. So I, I'm going to go very, very quickly here. In the 1980s and 1990s, there were a number of observational studies that were published, and they, they all found a lower risk of heart disease among postmenopausal women using hormone therapy, around 30% lower risk. Then there was a randomized trial as part of a women's health initiative, and that randomized trial found apparently the opposite, found a 24% increased risk of heart disease among women assigned to hormone therapy compared to women assigned to placebo. So this was, this was um, very shocking when, when it happens. And what was the problem? The problem was that the observational analysis were not emulating a target trial. What the randomized trial with the actual randomized trial from the Women's Health Initiative was doing was comparing women assigned to initiation of hormone therapy versus women assigned to placebo, to no initiation of hormone therapy. That was the intention to treat analysis from the trial. And they found a hazard ratio of 1.24. That's not what the observational studies did. What the observational studies, what they did was to compare women who happened to be taking hormone therapy versus women who were not taking hormone therapy at the start of follow-up. Something completely different from what a randomized trial would do. A randomized trial compares people at baseline when they, when they are subject to change, in this case, to initiation of hormone therapy. The observational analysis were not even trying to emulate that. They just compare women who happen to be taking hormone therapy and women who were not taking hormone therapy. In this particular example, what happened is that hormone therapy had a very short-term effect on the risk of heart disease, which we, which we found in the randomized trial. So that very short-term effect, which after two years, uh, two years after, base, after baseline in the trial, the hazard ratio was 1.5, 50% increased risk in the first two years of use, was completely lost in the observational studies because they were comparing women who had been already using hormone therapy for some time and who have not uh, developed heart disease. So if you now take the same data, the same observational data, and you compare women who, who start using hormone therapy versus women who don't, so the same type of comparison that you do in the randomized trial, then you find a hazard ratio in the first two years of 1.4, which is very close to what the trial find. And, uh, for those who have more interest in this type of analysis, this is something that we published um, more than ten years ago. Now. This is this is a this this is an old example. But so let me let me give you a newer one. There are many observational studies uh, published in the best clinical journals, in the New England Journal of Medicine, and many others, that have found that there is an association between use of statins and lower cancer risk. And when I say there is an association, it's, it's, it's a very strong one. Uh, many studies are finding 50% uh, lower risk or 60% lower risk of cancer among users of statins. Now, that is, um, that is wrong. And we know that is wrong because there are because there have been some meta-analysis of randomized trials that have shown absolutely no effect of statins on cancer incidence. But there are a lot of observational studies published, as I said, in the best journals. Again, when, when, the, when these um, problems happen with observational data, people tend to blame the lack of randomization in the observational data. 
And that is really one of my key messages here. Lack of randomization is a potential problem. It's often not the main problem. Think of the hormone therapy example. The problem was not lack of randomization. The problem was that the observational analysis was not even trying to emulate the target trial. Here, lack of randomization is probably less of a problem because the reason why people are use statins or not, why people are put on statins or not, are expected to be completely independent of their risk of cancer. If we were looking at heart disease as, as the outcome, it would be a, a very different story. But for cancer, what's the confounding for cancer? We don't expect lots of confounding. So what is going on here? Well, um, we did an analysis using electronic health records from the UK. This was published last year. And, uh, and the first thing that we did was to specify the protocol of the target trial of statins and cancer. I'm not going to spend time going over the protocol, but very, very quickly, we just apply the eligibility criteria that we will have applied in a randomized trial of statins and cancer. And then we compare the treatment, the, the two treatment strategies. One is initiation of statin therapy, and the other one is no initiation of statin therapy. Um, and if we had done a, the actual target trial, we would have followed people for 10 years or so un until cancer or death and compare in an intention to treat analysis, compare the incidence, the cumulative incidence of cancer. All right, so we did that with the observational data. And this is what we found. We found nothing. We found zero association between statins and cancer. Hazard ratios are all about one uh, for total cancer and for each of the main cancers. Um, if you look at the cumulative things, and, and this is the, the cancer-free sur survivor curve, you see that the, that the curves from the initiators and the non-initiators are overlapping. There's absolutely nothing going on in the ob observational data. Uh, but this is in complete contrast with many observational studies published in the best medical journals. So what is going on here? Well, we just took one of those previous studies, which has an odds ratio of lung cancer of 0.23. Just think for a second what that means. There is, some, there, there is a study published in a, in a serious journal that says that people, that there is an association of the magnitude that you are seeing there, 0.23. So over 70% lower risk of cancer among users of statins compared with non-users of statins. Actually, this is users of statins for more than four years versus non-users. If that were true, statins would be a miracle drug, okay? So we were looking at how the analysis was done in this particular paper, but it's the same for other papers. In this paper, the first thing that we found is that, again, they were not comparing initiators of statins versus not initiators of statins. Exactly the same problem that you saw in the hormone therapy example from 12 years ago. And the second problem is that they were using um, post-baseline information to assign people to groups at baseline. So they were looking at who was using statins for four years that's from baseline, if you put yourselves at the start of a study, you are looking into a future who is using statins for more than four years. And based on that future information that you don't have at baseline, you decide to put that person in the more than four years of use at baseline. That's a perfect recipe for immortal time bias. So if we do that with our own data, we also find relative risk of 0.2 or 0.3. Completely wrong. But that is how observational data are analyzed in practice and how these studies are published. The most important point here is that I've given you two very high profile examples of failures of real world data for causal inference, big failures. In both examples, the problem was not lack of randomization. It had nothing to do with lack of randomization. And yet, people keep talking about how we cannot use observational data because of lack of randomization. Again, lack of randomization may be a, a problem in many cases, 
but in many, in many other cases, that as that is not what is going on. It's just uh, an incorrect use of the of the observational data. In fact, if you think about what is going on in these two examples that, that I gave you, the problem is that time zero, the time zero of follow up, is not is not handled properly. Um, if you think about what time zero of follow up is in a randomized trial, that's the time. The, the time uh, for each person when the person is eligible, when the people, when the person is assigned to a treatment strategy, and when we start counting outcomes, those three things happen at the same time in a randomized trial. So if we are using observational data to emulate the target trial. We have to make sure that those three things happen at the at the same time too, and that's not what happened. For example, in the hormone therapy example, in which there was a misalignment of the time of eligibility and the time of initiation of hormone therapy. It will be uh, the second horizontal line that you see there, where A, the assignment to treatment happens uh, potentially years before the eligibility at, at time zero. Or you can have a case in which the, the assignment to a particular treatment group is done based on information that you have only potentially years after eligibility at baseline, and that will be the fourth horizontal line there. So anytime that we're using observational data to emulate a target trial, there are two things that we have to try to emulate. One is the randomized assignment. Of course, there is no randomized randomization in the, in the real world data, so we try to emulate that by adjusting for confounders. If we could adjust for all confounders, there will be no difference between a randomized trial and an observational study. But we are never sure if we are adjusting for all confounders. So that's always a big problem in analysis of real-world data. We may not have information on all the confounders, and therefore we, not, we may not be able to emulate the randomized assignment. Always something to keep in mind, always a potential danger. Second, we need to specify time zero at the right time. And that, unlike Adjustment for confounding is something that we can always do right, but is many times not done right. And the funny thing is that when observational analysis gets it wrong because lack because of an incorrect specification of, of time zero, people say, oh, that is because there is no randomization. Completely different things. In fact, if we want to improve causal inference from observational data, the low-hanging fruit is choosing time zero correctly. That's really the low hanging fruit here. Then we can worry about lack of randomization, but there is no point in worrying about lack of randomization when we're putting time zero in the in the right place. So if we, this, what I'm saying doesn't, please don't take it as I'm saying that lack of randomization is fine. No, I'm saying lack of randomization is a problem. But it's a problem that we can only worry about after we have done the rest of the emulation of a target trial correctly. In many examples, there is selection bias, there's, there is there is immortal time bias. These are all self-inflicted injuries, completely unnecessary. Lack of, ran, lack of randomization is not a self-inflicted injury, it's a fundamental limitation of, of causal inference from observational data. There are other examples that I could show you, and you have some references here in which we can show that real world data are not good for causal inference. For example, we, we were not able to use um, claims to estimate the correct effect of the screening for colorectal cancer on mortality. And this is a feature that happens every, every time that we want to estimate the effects of a, of a preventive intervention on mortality. There is so much confounding there that it's very unlikely that we'll be able to do it with observational data. Or if we're trying to estimate the effect of a treatment that is given only to people with certain conditions like anti-hypertensives, there's no way that we can use observational data for that. In that case, we can only use randomized trials. But there are many other cases where we could get it right. If only if we ask the question correctly and then by saying this is the protocol of a target trial, and if we answer the question uh, by either conducting the trial or emulating it 
using the observational data. Okay, and this this is um, one very important message I'm about to finish now is that we need we need to be explicit about what our causal question is. We need to explain what the target trial is because the rest of our analysis of the observational data will depend on that. And that is the problem that you are going to find in practice is that many journals will not let you say what your causal question is. Because the idea is if you are using observational data, you cannot talk about causal inference, only about associations. That attitude means you can never explain what you are trying to estimate with your observational data, which means you cannot justify how you are using the data or why you are doing that. This is, I hope, something that will change over the next few years. So every time that someone uh, gives you some observational estimates to estimate causal effects, um, just ask, what is the target trial? If the person looks puzzled, then you can, you can explain what you mean by that. And if there is no target trial that can be identified, that means that the question is not good enough and they have to ask a, a good question first, then trying to get estimates. So I'm going to finish here. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Miguel. This is uh, Devin speaking. I'm going to take it over from here and I'm going to uh, highlight some of the pilot projects that we've been conducting at Cytel in collaboration with Miguel. So I'll just preface really quickly by saying what a privilege it is to work with someone like Miguel, who's an incredible thinker and thought leader in this area. And if anyone's not familiar with his work, I highly recommend checking it out. So with that, I'll, I'll launch right into it. So again, why, why are we doing these target trial emulations? It's not to replace randomized trials, it's to provide complementary efficacy and safety evidence. And how might that evidence be used? Well, one of the ways is to inform reimbursement policies and prescription practices. And we can do this by leveraging the variability that often happens in the real world uh, with respect to the way in which patients are treated just due to differences in physician and patient preferences. So here are a few applications of this framework that can be used to inform reimbursement and prescription policies. Uh, the first one is to explore the treatment uh, within new indications. Uh, so just to give a specific example of that, you might see a randomized trial explore a chemotherapy with an alert third line setting. And then based on those third line results, certain areas might provide reimbursement for the treatment in first line settings. Uh, other areas might not reimburse in first line settings. So if there is real world data, we can potentially emulate a target trial looking at the efficacy and safety of this drug in first line settings uh, to inform reimbursement in other regions. Uh, second point is to assess the generalizability of clinical trial findings to real world patients. Uh, so especially in uh, oncologic settings where clinical trial patients uh, tends to be restricted to patients with a good performance status without much comorbidity, without a prior history of cancer. Uh, I've heard some oncologists call these patients the, the Olympians of cancer patients. And there's always a concern about whether uh, whether these clinical trial findings would hold when we apply them to patients with more comorbidity, uh, worse performance status, et cetera. So really these types of questions are these what if questions. What if my randomized trial or the, or the target trial uh, had expanded the eligibility criteria of interest? And just re really quickly, three other applications could be to optimize the delivery of an existing treatment. Uh, so I'll, I'll highlight an example of that later on where we look at the uh, duration of a drug. So this is a within treatment comparison. Uh, another application is to explore other outcomes of interest. So other outcomes that we've seen are looking uh, at healthcare resource utilization and the associated costs. And lastly, just to generate additional head-to-head -head, uh, treatment comparisons. So in some cases, the, the randomized trials might be small and there might not be very many. So there could be a lot of uncertainty in the estimates. Uh, so target trial emulations could potentially alleviate that uncertainty. Uh, in other cases, you might not be able to conduct an indirect treatment comparison using a network meta-analysis. 
either because the network's disconnected or because certain assumptions of the NMA aren't met. In those cases, uh, target trial emulation might help. So of course, there's a number of challenges. Uh, the, the first one here is insufficient variability in, in what you're looking at. Uh, so if you want to explore, for example, treatment duration, and there isn't much variability in real world practice, well, you can't uh, emulate that target trial. Uh, second obvious one is missing information on important confounders or potentially eligibility criteria. Uh, the third one I think gets overlooked a lot as well, but uh, measurement error. So in some uh, real world data sources, they don't directly collect information on, for example, stage or cancer recurrence. And people use algorithms uh, based on claims data to uh, identify those variables. And in those cases, there's going to be some misclassification. And in some cases, that misclassification might be too great uh, to conduct the study. Uh, the point at the bottom, imprecise estimates. So sometimes we have smaller sample sizes, but also the models that we sometimes have to implement are very complex and that there's a lot of parameters. Uh, so that can also lead to imprecise estimates. Uh, data access, of course, there's, there's going to be uh, costs to accessing data and time. But an another point that, that often gets overlooked is, is the lag time uh, of a data source. So if you have a novel therapy, that's undergone regulatory and HTA uh, approval. Now it's being used in the real world. Uh, well, uh, some real world data sources might have a lag time of, for example, three to four years. So you won't actually be able to start looking at that uh, treatment for, for another three to four years, potentially longer if you wanna look at survival outcomes. And the last one is poor data formatting. So sometimes a uh, data vendor will provide data in, in a very unusable format. It wasn't designed or put together by someone who's familiar with analyses. So uh, it's something that you don't want to overlook. It can take up considerable analyst time, just trying to generate clean variable names, uh, trying to make sense of the data, trying to generate uh, a data dictionary, items like that. So those are just a few of the challenges, and now I'll go into some of our ongoing pilot projects. Uh, so the first is a colon cancer example, looking at optimizing the duration of chemotherapy. Uh, the second is a pancreatic cancer example, where we're comparing different uh, chemotherapies. A third is a cardiovascular disease example, where we're looking at uh, different anti-hyperglycemic therapies in individuals with diabetes who did not uh, or who failed on first-line metformin. So this is a completed project that's currently under review. Uh, and the basic question that we're asking is, are we giving uh, cancer patients too much chemotherapy? Can we get away with giving them uh, less chemotherapy? And I'm sure as that everyone's aware, what you tend to see in a randomized trial is two chemotherapy, two or more chemotherapy regimens that are compared at a fixed duration. However, if we can get away with uh, giving a shorter duration that's equally efficacious, uh, that would increase the cost effectiveness and reduce the toxicity. Uh, and in real world settings, there's often a lot of variability in the number of cycles completed uh, due to various reasons. So uh, just for example, in stage three colon cancer, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40% of patients don't finish uh, the entirety of their uh, chemotherapy prescription. Uh, so some, some good news is there was a, a large, very large, well-conducted RCT that was published uh, that examined, uh, that compared three months of chemotherapy to the standard six months. Uh, this was a pooled analysis of six randomized trials, and they had uh, almost 13,000 patients. So we wanted to try to see if we could uh, replicate those results using real-world data, uh, using the framework that Miguel just presented, where we explicitly emulate a target trial modeled after that randomized trial. And the, the data source for this, we, we developed a partnership with the Oncology Outcomes Analytics Platform. It's a, it's a team of researchers and analysts uh, based in Alberta, Canada, and they access uh, provincial administrative data. Uh, there's a few reasons for partnering with this group. Uh, one, the data is representative, so it's population-based, so it captures all cancer cases in the province. Uh, second is they have access to very high-quality data. So we have detailed treatment information on the number of cycles completed. Whereas in other settings, uh, they might not 
capture every chemotherapy. Uh, for example, some, some data sources don't always capture every instance of oral chemotherapies. And the third part, third point is is the timeliness. So there's a there's a lag period of about one year with this data set. So uh, this partnership, we can really explore some more novel therapies. So this is going through just really high level, uh, kind of those points that Miguel mentioned that you want to try to emulate. Uh, in terms of the analysis and in, in some of our future webinars, uh, we hope to just go through uh, some of the specifics of what an analysis like this might look like, but for now we'll keep it fairly high level. So what we did was we compared our target trial emulation with two other analyses, uh, obviously the randomized trial, but we also compared it with this naive observational analysis. Uh, and you see this naive observational analysis, just exactly like the ones Miguel was just talking about, uh, and they're widely used in the observational literature. So. I previously led a publication looking at uh, the observational literature uh, that explored this question. And I, I believe there was 18 studies and all but one, uh, or 20 observational studies, excuse me, and all but one uh, would have suffered from the immortal time bias that Miguel mentioned. So they didn't correctly specify that uh, time point zero with respect to the treatment assignment. So we compared three analyses, and what did we find? Well, the blue estimate on the top is from this naive, uh, a naive analysis. The green estimate is from our target trial emulation, and the pinkish-orange estimate at the bottom is from the randomized trial. And what you see is the target trial emulation is giving us results that are consistent with the randomized trial. Uh, the, the precision is it's less precise just due to less patients. So there was, again, 13,000 patients in the RCT and about 500 in the emulation. But what you can see is the naive analysis, this is the take home point, is the naive analysis gets it wrong. And it's the exact same data set. And it's probably not just due to confounding, uh, especially with that CAPOX subgroup. So we see uh, the naive analysis is telling us that shorter durations are actually harmful. Uh, whereas in the target trial and the randomized trial, we see that shorter durations of CAPOX are probably appropriate uh, for some patients. So again, the big take home message here is naive analyses uh, can get it wrong. Uh, they often get it wrong. And uh, it's often not just due to confounding like Miguel was saying. Uh, that we can prevent these uh, sorts of selection and immortal time biases by explicitly emulating a target trial. Just kind of the last point too, these target trial emulations can really be conducted for a fraction of the cost and, and time. So if you can imagine doing a large randomized trial with 13,000 patients, uh, it took about 10 years, it's, it's not cheap. So really quickly, I'm just going to highlight some ongoing projects. So the first is a pancreatic cancer project. So right now, there's currently three chemotherapy regimens that are considered uh, to provide benefits to pancreatic cancer patients. Uh, two of these are more novel and were just introduced in the past five years. So we have a treatment network that looks something like this. So what we want to try to do is uh, conduct a, a three-arm trial where we compare these three drugs head-to-head -head. In terms of evidence from RCTs, you can see an indirect comparison there. Uh, th there's a bit of uncertainty. The estimate does uh, cross the null value of one. And also, if you look at the median survival in the control arm of the two trials, it's about seven months, whereas in the real world, we see uh, the median survival is about four months. So there's this lingering question about uh, if the real world patients are, are actually realizing these survival benefits that we saw in the clinical trials for these more novel uh, chemotherapies. And uh, the two more novel chemotherapies have never been compared head to head. And in addition, we plan to explore different outcomes and we plan to conduct these analyses within the O2 initiative that I mentioned previously. And then this example, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it. Uh, a colleague of mine, Ellen Gupta, is going to present on this uh, specific project on July 28th. Uh, so why, why are we doing this project? Well, M Miguel authored this uh, white paper 
uh, as part of the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI. And it's kind of a, a how-to guide or a blueprint for, for how you'd actually go about uh, explicitly emulating a target trial in practice. It's, it's an excellent read that I, I highly recommend. So we have this this blueprint, and we thought, well, why don't we we use it and try to uh, build upon it and actually emulate the target trial that's described within it? And this is just a bit of background information. Uh, so a lot of patients uh, fail on metformin, a lot of patients with diabetes, so they require some sort of second line therapy. And there's a lot of different choices, but there's not much head to head evidence. So we really need some comparative efficacy evidence here. So we're gonna compare different treatments. We're gonna explore different outcomes. And for this project, we're partnering with Nashville Biosciences. So again, uh, on the presentation on the 28th, we'll go into more detail on uh, on the data and, and these specific analyses. And so uh, Darren at the beginning of this presentation mentioned that this is gonna be a series. So what, what can you expect to see in, in the next uh, webinars? Well, what, what we're doing for these ongoing projects is uh, exactly what Miguel mentioned. We're gonna start by specifying the target trial that we wanna look at, and then we're going to uh, then attempt to emulate that part target trial. We're going to try to conduct some statistical analyses. Uh, we're gonna explore different uh, quote unquote safety mechanisms to see if our target trial emulation got it wrong. And there's a, there's a good, uh, publication and then the example I mentioned previously, the white paper, Miguel talks about a few of these different approaches. So benchmarking the results with an RCT. Uh, sometimes you don't always have an RCT to benchmark against. So there's other approaches you can explore as well, like using positive or negative outcome controls. And lastly, we want to explore some sensitivity analyses uh, to see if we can potentially explain any remaining differences between the observational and randomized uh, evidence. And I refer there to another publication uh, by Miguel and his team. So I mentioned this, I'll just say it again, uh, we're presenting the second webinar in this series on July 28th. And in this, uh, we're going to provide an in-depth discussion about uh, the methods and the data for that cardiovascular disease project. Subsequent webinars are going to highlight some of the ongoing results and we'll, we'll highlight some of the real world challenges uh, that were faced and, and provide some practical recommendations uh, for anyone who's looking to conduct these sorts of analyses. So just really quickly to wrap it up. If you have some high quality real world data, you can potentially emulate a target trial and you can use these results to inform reimbursement or treatment practices uh, within the real world. Uh, it's a highly efficient, low cost solution to explore these what if questions uh, related to expanding characteristics of your randomized trial, such as the label population, uh, potentially the uh, way in which the treatments are administered or potentially the outcomes or additional treatment arms in the trial. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Darren who will lead a questions and answer session. Great, thanks so much uh, both Miguel and Devin for two very clear webinar talks. Uh, so just as a reminder, we'll be having the follow-up webinar on the 28th of July to go over the CBD pilot project and then a follow-up uh, to the, the pilot project that Devin showed on pancreatic cancer later in the summer. So jumping into the question and answer, uh, we'll begin with the questions that have been submitted through today's presentation. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit questions, and I see quite a few are jumping in now uh, through the control panel. Um, so the first question that came in uh, was from Meritib Aragay, and his question was, Nowadays, in randomized clinical trials, we are using estimate, language, or causal inference to handle informative missing. Your talk is more linked to observational studies. What are, are your thoughts on the use of estimate or causal inference in randomized trials, and when should we use it? Okay, I can, I can take that. So um, this is uh, the use of the word estimate in, in randomized trial is, a, is kind of a misnomer. It, it should be causal estimate uh, because of course an estimate is, is something that you estimate that that all that it means uh, the people who wrote the day nine 
uh, Dendum were not uh, brave enough to use the word causal estimate, which is what they are talking about. They're not talking about estimates in general, they're talking about causal estimates. So if if you think about the about the causal estimates that are described in the A9 addendum, they are exactly the same causal estimates that I've been talking about. That's the whole point. If you are using data to make causal inferences, the first thing you have to do is to is to explain what your estimate is, what your causal estimate is. You have to do that in randomized trials. You have to do that in observational studies. There's absolutely no difference. And then you have to explain how you are going to estimate that causal estimate. In randomized trials for a very long time, the causal estimate by default was the intention to treat effect, which in the E9, they call the treatment policy effect. Of course, every causal estimate is a treatment policy effect. It's just a different treatment policy. So that's that's not a very good name, but um, it it means the intention to treat effect. That has been the default causal estimate in trials. Now we are getting into into an into a new period in which we realize that it is a waste in many cases to use only the intention to treat effect. And in other cases, it's not appropriate to use the intention to treat effect, like in safety trials or in non-inferiority trials. And in other cases, we cannot estimate the intention to treat effect without assumptions, which happens when there is missing data. There are losses to follow up. If there are losses to follow up, we cannot estimate the intention to treat effect using an intention to treat analysis. We have to make additional assumptions. But really, there is no difference. Everything that I've described for observational data here, it was either trying to estimate the intention to treat effect or, or an, an, an observational analog of the intention to treat effect or an observational analog of a pair protocol effect. And by a pair protocol effect, I don't mean what people usually estimate with a pair protocol analysis. We say naive pair protocol analysis. I mean the the real causal estimate, the effect that you have found if people have followed the protocol. And that is the that is um, possibly the most important causal estimate after the intention to treat effect in randomized trials. So there's really no difference. That's my point. It's, it's just data. The only difference is that in the randomized trials, we expect no confounding at baseline. Whereas in observational studies, we may have confounding at baseline. But to estimate more interesting causal estimates, like the per protocol effect, we need to adjust for confounders after baseline. And those exist both in randomized trials and in observational studies. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Miguel. So the second question comes from Leo Phillip, and I think this is likely directed towards Devin. So how do the naive and target trial analyses shown here differ? Thanks. Uh, yeah, so, so there's, a, there's a few differences. So the, the first one is this issue of a mortal time bias that Miguel has mentioned. So if you go back to uh, the slide that, uh, when you review this webinar, if you look at the slide that Miguel presented with the horizontal lines, uh, the naive analysis fell into the, the last horizontal line uh, so we're comparing uh, six months of chemotherapy uh, to a shortened duration. And what people uh, do is they they make a zero one variable indicating whether or not the patient actually completed six months or whether they actually completed three months. So by that definition, people in the six month arm, they couldn't have died for for that three month period. That's that's what we mean when we say uh, there's a mortal time. They have this three month survival advantage right off the bat. Um, so that's uh, one difference. And then there's two others that I talk about. Uh, one is is this question of a dynamic treatment, which uh, we can go into in future webinars, uh, which just means that there's certain treatment modifications that should happen. Uh, so in this case, a patient should stop chemotherapy early if they experience uh, cardiovascular toxicity. Uh, and then the third one was this question of uh, treatment-related toxicity. So Miguel just talked about how we uh, have to adjust for 
post-randomization variables when we want to estimate the per protocol effect uh, in both observational and randomized settings. Uh, so in those specific analyses, we adjusted for treatment-related toxicity, uh, but we did not in the naive analyses. Thanks. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Devin. Um, so the next question comes from Alicia Shillington. Uh, so her question is, how would your approach change if you're trying to do head-to-head -head comparisons with real-world data that did not necessarily emulate our trial, particularly in oncology where patients with poor performance status are included? Or excluded, sorry. I'm, I'm not sure I'm I'm following the question. If you want to, you are, made, you are uh, making a head-to-head -head comparison. It's because in the real world, there is a decision that has to be made between treatment A and treatment B. And therefore, you either conduct a head-to-head -head trial or use observational data to emulate a head-to-head -head trial of A versus B. So just to clarify then, I think the question is getting at using the pancreatic example where there isn't actually a direct head-to-head -head trial comparison. So uh, I suppose then is the best approach to use the arms of the other trials that might have been used to compare the sim therapies, but that aren't actually used in one A to B comparison? Um, see, if, um, see that there are two different issues here. One is what is the question that is being asked? Is A versus B? That is the head-to-head -head mm -hmm. comparison. That's, that, is in, that, is a, that is a question that we ask to inform a decision. The second part is which data do you use to make that comparison? And um, if you can either do a randomized trial, you have one, or you can use observational data. If in the real world that's not done, if there are no there are no head-to-head -head comparisons in the real world of A versus B, then then we cannot use observational data. Uh, or if the comparisons are too are comparing two different uh, groups of patients, there's so much confounding, then we cannot use observational data either. Uh, is that getting closer to the answer? I'm not sure. Yeah, I believe so. I believe that that covers it. And yeah, we'll maybe, have a bit more. Yeah, go ahead, Devin. Yeah, maybe I could just add a, a couple of points to that. So uh, the PCORI paper that Miguel talked about really walks you through, through a lot of the specifics. And towards the end of that paper, he talks about uh, benchmarking uh, our emulations with existing randomized trials. So in the pancreatic cancer example, if we want to... Uh, emulate a target trial uh, where patients were eligible regardless of their performance status or regardless of their comorbidity, et cetera. We can emulate, we can try to emulate that target trial, but what we can also do is emulate a separate target trial that has the exact same eligibility criteria as those used in the randomized trials that I referenced. And then we can uh, see if we're getting similar results to the randomized trial. And if we are, that gives us some assurance that our other trial emulation with the expanded eligibility criteria uh, is telling us something meaningful. Great, thanks, Devin, for the clarification. Um, so there's uh, quite a few questions that came in very similar to uh, what is the method for identification uh, to identify appropriate real-world data sources? I, I can try. Give a give an answer there, and then then maybe Devon wants to to say more. Um, that that is that is an excellent question, of course. Um, th there are three things that three key data elements that we need for the emulation. One is uh, good information on the treatment of interest over time. Um, the second is good information on the outcomes of interest over time. And the third one is good information on the confounders over time. Um, so for any target trial that we are trying to emulate, we need to think in terms of those three data elements, which are key. For example, many uh, claims databases have relatively good information on treatment and outcomes, but very poor information on confounders for some questions. If we want to, I don't know, if we want to emulate a trial of statins and coronary heart disease, we might use claims for both for statins and for coronary heart disease, but we have no information on 
LDL and other lab values. So there is no chance we are ever going to be able to succeed in emulating a target trial of statins and heart disease with a claims database. This is a case where we will need to use electronic health records or, or some form of real world database that is linked to, to lab values. So there is no, um, there is no general answer. It's, it's on a case by case thinking in terms of the treatments, the outcomes, and the compounders. Maybe uh, one small thing I would add, and this is something that uh, Miguel, Miguel taught me, was that if, if you're ever working with a real world data source, you really want to work with a key opinion leader, a, uh, a clinician who is not only familiar with the data, but actually practices uh, within the setting where the data is collected. And when you uh, work with someone like that, they can really help you to identify uh, the appropriateness or the feasibility of the data based on those issues that Miguel mentioned. Excellent, thanks so much. Um, I think we have time for just one more question. And uh, there's a few questions that are very similar um, from Yeni Yeder and from Nur Noor. Um, can we ask Miguel's thoughts on the target trial approach versus uh, indirect network meta-analysis uh, using RCTs? Are there any examples or scenarios where you could conceive that a target trial from observational data may be superior to indirect uh, treatment comparisons from uh, RCTs? Uh, well, this, these are two, two forms of observational data analysis. One is using the, uh, using the observational databases, and the other one is making an observational comparison of different trials. The, um, the 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 main advantage of the, the main advantage of the target trial emulation using observational databases is that it allows you one to make comparisons of treatment strategies that have never been compared in trials yet, and two that it allows to make comparisons of treatment strategies that are more complex and more with more detail. For example, we may want to compare a treatment strategy that is um, do not take treatment until uh, this particular lab value goes below 100 and then start taking treatment and take it unless there is um, unless there is, a, there is toxicity, in, in which case you have to switch to treatment B rather than the A that you were taking, etc. So that that time of real world comparisons about real world clinical strategies is something that uh, for which observational databases may be better positioned because it, it has the richness of data that allows you to compare those things. Whereas for network meta analysis, you have to live with whatever people have compared before. Yeah, thanks so much, Miguel. Thanks, Tracy. Um, so unfortunately, we we're not able to answer everyone's questions, but I think it just reflects the quality of the presentations and the excitement and interest for the topic. Uh, thanks again to Miguel and Devin for a very informative session, and thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar, Head-to-Head -head Comparisons Using Real-World Data. So on behalf of Cytel and the presenters, thanks for, for joining us today. Stay tuned for invites to subsequent webinars, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.